Welcome everyone to Adaptive Socio-Technical Systems with Architecture for Flow. So today we have heard a little, a little already, um, thanks to Eduardo and Michael from the previous talks. So can you guess what these companies have in common? <laughs> yes, I, I see some signs like this one. Exactly. <laughs> they have in common that they don't exist anymore, or at least not with their original core business. So all of these companies, they filed for bankruptcy or um, sold their core business. Um, but why? What was the reasons uh, for those companies to shut down or selling their businesses? The major reason were the failure to adapt. These companies failed to adapt to and keep up to new and changing circumstances so that they were forced to file for bankruptcy or selling their core business in the end which led to massive job and financial losses, not only in the US, but also worldwide. So in today's fast-paced business environment, it's essential for organizations to continuously adapt and evolve to remain competitive and stay relevant in the market. And the question is now how to design and build a system that can evolve and thrive in the face of constant change. One approach that I would like to tackle today is um, uh, to tackle the situation from a rather holistic view and combining various perspectives. So it requires on the one side to understand the landscape an organization is operating and competing in, including understanding the um, external forces that are acting on the landscape. It requires to gain a shared understanding of the business domain to build a system that is closely aligned to the business and user needs and to the business strategy. It requires to align not only the technical solution, but also the teams um, to and evolving their interaction to the system we build and the strategy we plan. Or, in other words, um, one approach could be connecting the dots um, between wildly mapping domain-driven design and team topologies. And let's demonstrate this approach by evolving a legacy system um, using an example of an online school solution for junior students. You might have heard of this uh, example already before. And we can start with gaining a common understanding of the business landscape by creating a Wardley map that is visuali visualizing the landscape of an organization. And a Wardley map is part of Wardley mapping, a business strategy framework invented by Simon Wardley. And for an organization, it's, it's, it's essential um, to know their users and their user needs. So they are the subject area for which to build a product. And the user and user needs, they are representing the anchor of the map. And those user needs are directly or indirectly um, fulfilled by a chain of components um, generating value for the users and representing the value chain on the y-axis. And the components of the value chain, they are typically mapped um, to evolution stages on the x-axis, such as genesis um, with brand new things, then custom build, product and rentals, such as off-the-shelf products or open source software solutions, and commodity and utility on the right. And each evolution stage comes with different characteristics. So towards the left spectrum, the components are changing far more frequently than components on the right spectrum. So on the left spectrum, we are dealing with high level of uncertainties, unknown unknowns, um, and an undefined, poorly understood market. While on the right spectrum, the components become more stable, um, known, widespread, standardized, and the markets are well-defined and mature, mature. And the Wardley map itself provides a structured uh, way to discuss and generate a common understanding um, of the landscape and within a group, and also challenge our own assumptions of our landscape within this group. And the, le the map itself helps us to identify areas where an organiz organ organization can innovate, where an organization can improve efficiency or outsource to utility suppliers to gain competitive advantage. But that requires to understand the external forces that are impacting the landscape. So and that's where we come to the climatic patterns. Climatic patterns are describing the external rules and external forces that are influencing a landscape over which we have no control. However, Understanding climatic patterns is important when anticipating change according to Simon Wardley. So understanding climatic patterns gives us an idea where the landscape might change and where to invest in the future. So one pattern is that 
the landscape is never static, but very dynamic, so everything evolves from left to right through the forces of supply and demand competition. For example, cloud-hosted services reflect this climatic pattern. What was decades ago non-existent evolved through uh, Genesis custom build, became product and rental and commodity and utility. Or large language models evolved thanks to competition-driven technology advancement and are, became available um, as products. So in the standardization and industrialization of components increases efficiency. And this brings us to another climatic pattern of efficiency enables innovation. So the industrialization and standardization and, and their efficient provision enables the innovations of others. For example, it enables that um, new features of existing products can appear or that other components can co-evolve or that new components can emerge. And it's the genesis of new components that enables new user needs, creating future source of value as another climatic pattern. So understanding the climatic pattern and the landscape um, helps us to anticipate opportunities uh, from a business strategy point of view and gives us an idea of areas um, of potential change and where to invest to gain competitive advantage. But um, before applying those changes in investments, we also need to assess how well we are equipped as an organization to respond to those changes quickly and to absorb changes gracefully. And that requires to look at our system as a, um, as a whole rather than looking only at isolated parts. Dr. Russell Eckhoff, one of the pioneers of the system thinking movement, stated that a system is more than the sum of its parts. It's a product of their interactions. So the way parts fit together determines the performance of a system, not on how they perform taken separately. And that reminds us to analyze our system or the dependencies between the parts of our system to assess our responsiveness to change. So from an architecture point, architecture point of view, um, we need to analyze how the parts are coupled together. In our example, we are dealing with a monolithic big ball of mud with a very messy model and no clear um, module boundaries, so leading to tight change coupling. And with tight change coupling, it's impossible to modify on only one part of the system without um, affecting or um, um, impacting other parts of our system, and also um, where we are facing a high risk of, of breaking things. And with um, the business logic mingled together in a messy model, um, it takes a high amount um, of effort and time to understand a piece of code. And fuzzy boundaries, um, and the fuzzy boundaries of in our monolithic big ball of mud, it's difficult to establish clear ownership boundaries, leading both to high team cognitive load. And if the team cognitive load is largely exceeded, it becomes a delivery bottleneck. So, and we also need to analyze not only um, our architecture point of view, but also we need to analyze where teams depend on other teams' activities and expertise to get their work done. So do the um, teams need to rep repeatedly hand over their work to other teams at a later stage of flow to get their work completed? The teams of our online school example, they are currently organized as functional silo teams. And implementing and releasing changes um, from front end to back end requires to hand over work from UI, back end, and infrastructure teams. And hand over itself, that requires a high amount of ongoing and frequent communication and coordination efforts between multiple teams to implement and deliver changes. So, and if teams cannot keep up with uh, the demand, placed on those, those teams, their work is piling up, and uh, that also cause other teams wake, waiting for them, and their work cannot be uh, completed and delivered. So they become a constraint. And constraints in the system, they dictate the system's overall performance. 
We also have to consider uh, potential efficiency gaps. So if the evolution stage of the components in our organization differ from the ones that are available in the market, that might indicate an efficiency gap. And I will address this in a, a bit later. So tightly coupled architecture, high team cognitive load, functional silo teams with handover, high communication and coordination efforts between teams, delivery bottlenecks, efficiency gaps, that Mm, I guess it's not very responsive to change. So that leads to a system which is poorly equipped to respond to changes quickly and absorb changes gracefully. So to increase our responsiveness to change, we need to optimize our system for fast flow of change. And optimizing for fast law of change requires to manage our dependencies and our constraints. So a modular, well-encapsulated, loosely coupled architecture enables then teams to move, um, to move forward safely and quickly and with a high level of autonomy and a low risk to, to break things. And with cross-functional, um, um, small autonomous teams, we make repeated handover redundant and, uh, um, and also can, can minimize the communication and coordination efforts between multiple teams. And a modular, well-encapsulated architecture itself helps also to establish well-defined ownership boundaries, minimizing our cognitive load. Eliminating constraints in our system increase the system's overall performance and closing efficiency gaps helps us to increase efficiency. So to increase the efficiency um, or the, the responsiveness to change, we need to design adaptive socio-technical systems that are optimized for a fast law of change. And one approach to achieve this could be combi by combining wordly mapping domain-driven design and team topology as architecture for flow. And we can use the previously created Wardle map that I've started with um, of the online school um, solution as a structure that guides us through the optimization process. And um, optimizing a system for a fast flow of change requires to know where the most important changes in our system occur, the streams of changes. And the, streams, um, the type of stream can vary in every organization, and they can range from task, role, activity, geography, customer segment-oriented uh, stream types. In our current um, example, our current online school example, we are focusing on the activity streams of changes uh, represented by the user needs of our Wardly map. So they need to be focused on when optimizing for flow. And the users and the user needs not only represent the anchor of our map, but also represent uh, the problem domain. And that's where we come to domain-driven design. So domain-driven design helps us to understand, um, to create, a, generate a shared understanding of our problem domain, and also helps us to partition our problem domain into smaller parts, of the subdomains. But not all subdomains are equal to the business, so some subdomains are more valuable to, to the business um, than the others who have different types of subdomains. So in the core domain, that is the essential part of our problem domain, providing competitive advantage. That is the subdomain we have to strategically invest in most and build in-house. The supporting subdomain, that's uh, the subdomains that help to support uh, the core domain, and uh, they do not provide competitive advantage, um, but, uh, but are necessary for the organization to succeed, and are typically prevalent, they are typically existing also in other competitive solutions as well. So if possible, we should look out for buying off-the-shelf products or, um, or using open-source software solution for the supporting subdomains. If that is not possible, if we need a higher level of customization, um, we have to, and, we have to, and if we have to custom build the supporting subdomains, we should be aware that we should not heavily invest in that part of the system because it does not provide competitive advantage. The generic subdomains, these are subdomains that many business systems have, regardless if they are our competitors or not. So for example, authentication and registration. So they aren't core, they provide no competitive advantage, but um, our business or businesses in, in general cannot work uh, without them. So buying off-the-shelf products uh, um, or using open source software solution or outsourcing to utility suppliers, that could be applied to generic subdomains. So 
in general, subdomain types helps us to prioritize our strategic investments and also support us in our build, buy, and outsource decision. However, what I've experienced is that the, um, it's not a binary decision, like um, only either buy, um, build, or buy. Uh, typically, it's also a combination um, of build and buy. But the solution, so we were coming from the problem domain, our business domain, and now we are switching to the solution space, and currently the solution of our subdomains are currently all mingled together in a beautifully tightly coupled monolithic big ball of mud with a messy model and no clear boundaries. And Constancy's law says a structure is stable if cohesion is strong and coupling is low. And high cohesion and loose coupling, that enables the system to be amenable um, uh, to change, that enables the system to be responsive to change. And to achieve high cohesion, we need to group related business behavior together at one place. And that is where bounded contexts of domain-driven design can help us with. A bounded context itself groups related business behavior together and defines where a single domain model can be applied, where a single domain model uh, can live in that encapsulate a particularly business logic of a, of a subdomain. And bounded contexts are for enforcing high cohesion and uh, modularity. So they are indicating good domain-specific um, themes to split our system into smaller parts um, and uh, into, yeah, into, into modular, well-encapsulated parts. However, bounded contexts do not mandate, uh, mandate a particular architecture style. So even though they are good candidates for microservices, it does not necessarily to be implemented. They don't have to necessarily be implemented in microservices. They can go, go also with modular monoliths or uh, service-based uh, domain services and, and more. And designing bounded contexts and their, um, their um, um, domain models, that involves a close collaboration between the domain experts and development teams in order to gain a shared understanding of our, of our domain. And there exist several techniques um, that are um, also complementing each other, for example, event storming, domain storytelling, example mapping, and so on. So let's go now to the other dimension of Constantine's law, and that aims for loose coupling. So we, need, we also need to assess the coupling between bounded contexts, and that's where context maps can help us with. So let's assess coupling of our core domain-related bounded contexts in particular. So since the core domain, as I mentioned earlier, um, the core domain-related bounded context, they provide competitive advantage, and they are strategically important to our business. And they tend to be quite complex, and they um, tend to change very frequently. So when integrating with core domain-related bounded context, we need to focus on loose coupling or loose change coupling to, to avoid impeding um, the evolution of the uh, most critical, business-critical parts of our system. And change coupling itself, um, that addresses how significantly a change of one part impacts other parts of our systems. And context maps provide patterns to describe uh, the integration between bounded contexts and also the relationship, their relationship between teams owning those bounded contexts. So to achieve loose coupling when integrating with a core domain-related bounded context, we need to make sure that the core domain can evolve independently. So we need to avoid exposing our internal core domain uh, internals to the outside. Instead, we need to establish a translation and transformation mechanisms. So the context map pattern of open host service that provides a public API um, to multiple downstream consumers. So, and it offers to translate and transform uh, the internal domain model um, to the external API so that it helps to decouple uh, the implementation of the internal domain model from the outside so that the internal domain model can evolve in independently from its API. And when integrating with a poorly designed upstream model, for example, with our big ball of mud, we need to protect the, um, the propagation of this um, messy model downstream to the, specifically in particular to the core domain. 
So, and here an anti-corruption layer, another um, context map pattern, helps us to translate the external upstream model um, downstream into inter internal downstream model. And uh, also, yeah, helps to, pro to, to pre protect us to propagate a messy model downstream and in into our, in our uh, domain logic. And the anti-corruption layer keeps the business critical part of the problem domain clear from um, external concepts that are not relevant for our concept or context and uh, helps us to protect from poorly designed uh, upstream models. We also need to avoid conforming to a volatile core when we integrate with our core domains when, um, under one condition when no backwards compatibility is, uh, is given. So the conf conformist itself, that's a um, context map patterns that adheres the downstream model to the upstream model and without any transformation or translation. So conforming to a volatile upstream model like the core domain is, when, when there is no backward compatibility provided, that should be, uh, that requires then a lot of, um, a lot of attention um, handling the source of constant change. So um, we need to avoid it when we have no backward compatibility, and I can't pronounce that word, sorry. We also need to minimize the duplication of complex behavior. So with separate ways, um, as another pattern, we are duplicating functionality um, for specific reasons when we try to avoid integration with, an integration with another bounded context. And using separate ways with core domain, um, that could be very expensive since we, that would require to duplicate complex functionality of the core domain. And this will also weaken uh, the high cohesion of the core domain's related bounded context. So changing behavior in a core domain that would then require this change across multiple bounded contexts, which then slows down our um, responsiveness, uh, our, our um, flow of change and requires to coordinate with the other teams and uh, to make the change effective. So if a customer supplier relationship, uh, uh, in this case, the upstream supplier teams provide services to the downstream customer teams, and this pattern describes a team relationship that enables the downstream customer to gain influence over the upstream supplier team. For example, the downstream consumer um, team, they can impact the priorities or planning and tasks um, of the upstream supplier, supplier team. And a customer with, with competing changes or with competing change requests or a customer vetoing future changes, they could block uh, the evolution of the supplier of a highly business critical part. So we have to avoid this. And the last one, uh, with the partnership, teams are coll collaborating together towards an aligned uh, common goal. And the partnership itself in, um, requires a high level of communication, coordination between, um, between the teams. And especially a partnership with a volatile core domain that would require a high amount of communication and coordination effort between those teams, which slows down also the development uh, of the strategically important parts um, that um, potentially need to change fast. So the, this kind of relationship would also impede our flow of changes. So context maps patterns that help us to make change coupling uh, visible, and they are addressing coupling via contracts and model propagation and inter-team relationships. And context maps, they can expose problematic dependencies leading to tight change coupling and impeding also and slowing down our, um, uh, our flow, fast flow of change. But let's go now back to our Wardler map. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the bounded context, they serve as well-defined uh, ownership boundaries, and that makes bounded context also good candidates for team boundaries for stream-aligned teams. And as has also been already mentioned before, stream-aligned teams were introduced by Matthew Skeltons and Manuel Paish in their book Team Topologies that they published in 2019. And stream-aligned teams are autonomous cross-functional teams that are aligned to a continuous stream of work um, and focusing on a fast flow of changes. 
So to be able to um, produce a steady flow of feature deliveries, to be able to focus on a fast flow of changes, the Streamline teams, they need the support from other teams, for example, from platform teams. Platform teams, they support the Streamline teams delivering their work, and they are responsible for platforms that the Streamline teams can easily consume. And the platform itself, that can vary in its level of abstraction. So at a lower level, a platform can abstract away infrastructure, cross-cutting, networking capabilities. And at a higher level, um, a platform can also abstract away um, a design system or a data platform and much more. So the platform teams, they provide internal self-service services and tools that um, for using that platform they are responsible for. And the enabling teams, as we have heard earlier from the previous talks from Eduardo and Michael, um, they help to um, the streamline teams to identify and acquire miss missing capabilities working as uh, internal coaches in your organization. Or um, the streamline teams can also get support from the complicated subsystem teams that uh, as an optional team type. And that um, complicated subsystem teams, they are supporting the streamline teams on particularly complicated subsystems that require very specialized knowledge. And they all aim to increase the autonomy and reduce the team cognitive load of the streamline teams to enable a fast flow of change in the end. But just to organize these teams and these team types uh, is not enough to become effective. So how the teams are interacting with each other and when to evolve the team interaction is also very critical for organizational effectiveness. With, with collaboration, teams are working very closely together uh, over a limited period of time. And um, it is suitable for rapid discovery and innovation. And for example, when exploring new technologies and itself, like collaboration, is meant to be short-lived. And with X as a service, that suits well when one uh, team needs to use, for example, a code library or a component, an API, or a platform that can be effectively provided by another team as a service. And it works best where predictable delivery is needed. And um, facilitation, that is the interaction mode that comes into play when one team would uh, need active help from another team. And this is uh, the interaction mode that is typical for, for the enabling teams. So coming back to our water map again, uh, Streamaligned teams, they are relying, as I mentioned earlier, on other teams supporting them delivering their own work. And um, that requires that we need to identify uh, services that need to support a reliable, um, a reliable flow of change um, and that can, can easily consume or that can easily uh, uh, um, can form a easily consumable X as a service. So in our example, um, the infrastructure-related components of our water map located in the product and rental or commodity and utility evolution stage, they can form um, uh, a platform or a, a good candidates for forming a platform that can be effectively provided as a service by platform teams. And this platform can start small. So it, um, it can start with documentation, standards, best practices, templates, and can evolve later uh, into a digital platform uh, with self-service APIs and tools. So this previous consideration might result in this very first draft um, of Team Constellation um, as a very first simplified draft. So where the bounded context, they are um, going to be handled by multiple streamlined teams and the infrastructure components in this example by one or multiple platform teams, but we will address the platform teams a little bit later. But we need to also to consider that not only skill set is uh, um, required, but also the preference and mindset um, of the teams when composing teams. And Simon Wardley has introduced um, or suggests the think aptitude and attitude, which means that not only uh, it's not only skill set, the aptitude is relevant, but also the mindset, the attitude. So dealing with components in different evolution stages requires uh, different mindsets. And um, so my take here is that, um, that the, uh, the teams should be 
composed of, of um, different mindsets by teams. So teams that are owning components in Genesis or custom build, they tend towards an explorer mindset with a preference for discovering and experimenting. And teams owning components in product and rental, they might prefer to improve and stabilize uh, with a villager mindset. Or teams owning commodity and utility um, components might prefer to mature and optimize with a time planner mindset. So that mix of mindsets per teams allows to respond to changes in different ways to different situations. So a team owning commodity components can also switch to exploration mode using agile techniques and closely collaborate with other teams for a limited period of time, for example, when exploring new technologies. So in this we were going to address when we are, when we are analyzing um, our Bartley map again, and we might analyze and identify potential efficiency gap um, that I have ma mentioned earlier. And from the climatic patterns uh, we have learned earlier that everything evolves through the forces of demand and, demand and supply competition. And if the components in our organization differ from the ones um, that are equivalent in the market, that might indicate efficiency gap. And one approach we can do here is to close this efficiency gap by migrating to cloud-hosted services. So the question is how to transition, and I have to um, re uh, go quickly through this one. So optimizing our system for faster of change um, is led by dynamically reteaming the functional silo teams into the platform and streamlined teams and evolving their interaction along a cloud migration journey. And the transition could start with forming a platform team first that kicks off the replatforming cloud migration. And with replatforming, we are then um, we are replacing the infrastructure component with cloud hosted services. Um, then next, the streamline teams can form. They can take care of refactoring the applications. So with refactoring, we are splitting our applications architecture into smaller parts. And the uh, refactoring journey is supported by an evolution of team topology interaction modes, where the, team, where the platform team and streamline teams are collaborating at the, first, at the beginning very closely together, and then later on, uh, where the platform teams can provide um, excessive services to, to, uh, um, to use the services they provide. And the next streamline team can form and refactor their bounded context and get on their uh, refactoring journey and support, get support as facilitation from the previous platform and streamline teams sharing their knowledge. So at the at end, we could refactor our monolithic big ball of mud into modular well-designed, well-encapsulated, loosely coupled architecture with bounded context and formed cross-functional streamlined teams and platform teams um, aligned, uh, and aligned their interactions to support a cloud migration journey. And we also have optimized our system for flow by minimizing co team cognitive load, handover, communication and coordination efforts between teams and eliminate delivery bottlenecks. And we don't have to stop here. We can also create water maps from, for um, internal purposes as well. So where we are switching then the streamlined teams as the internal users of the um, uh, platform teams that are providing their, their services, for example, um, to provide like um, a, a pipeline as a service, to build, test, uh, and deploy and release the services, or monitoring the service to monitor and, and operate the services, or um, for example, a platform as a service um, to provision the runtime environment for the services or bounded context, including necessary components um, their service rely on during runtime. Or a platform also, as I said, can vary its level of abstraction. And at a higher level, a platform can also reflect a design system where the um, platform team can provide, for example, a style guides, uh, um, widget libraries, and more. And the enabling team then can identify a identify uh, missing capabilities and try to, to um, close uh, um, capability gaps in the other teams, uh, working as internal coaches, not only for the streamlining teams, but also for the platform teams, and uh, yeah, help them to, to, um, to upskill the streamline and platform teams themselves. And you might object, why should we, we are successful, why should we change? Uh, that is fine as long as you have no competition or your competitors are less evolved than you. But be aware that you might face inertia to change. And inertia to change, created by past success, 
that is impeding the evolution of components. And it's not the lack of innovation that can kill an organization, but their inertia to change. For example, Nokia was very innovative, but they were very reluctant to fully transition to this new smartphone area back then. And within six years, their market share dropped by an over 90%. So uh, being successful today doesn't mean you stay su successful tomorrow. So when the world around you changes and when the market change, you have to change too. So investing in adaptive socio-technical systems optimized for a fast flow of change equips us to thrive in the face of constant change. We, can, we are now in a position where we are able not only to respond to changes, but also to lead future changes. Um, we are now in a position where we can create additional differentiating values, where we can also uh, be first mover to commoditize components or building corporations and alliances to accelerate the evolution of components. So now we are in the driving seat of change. But I guess I've overwhelmed your cognitive flow today. So, but the good thing is you can start small. You don't have to apply all of it once. Um, start with those that are most um, suitable and most useful for your own context. And you can start with creating a word limit first or try to analyze your current team constellation or try, try to analyze your current system um, and to, to, to identify um, good themes to split it apart and also have loose coupling in mind. And then eventually they are across uh, passes will cross. As a summarize, um, the combination of water mapping, domain-driven design, and team topologies, that helps us to understand and um, to understand uh, the landscape an organization is operating and competing in, and also uh, including understanding the external forces that are acting on the landscape. It helps us to anticipate changes and to, um, to identify potential points for evolution. It helps us to gain a shared understanding of our domain and discovering the core domain providing competitive advantage. It helps us to know what components to build in-house, where to use or buy off-the-shelf products or open-source software solutions or outsource to utility suppliers. It helps us to establish a well modular, well-encapsulated architecture with well-defined ownership boundaries um, with the aid of uh, um, co bounded contexts. It helps us to align our teams and evolve their interaction to the system we build and the strategy we plan and also eliminating bottlenecks, increasing software delivery performance. And so three of them, they are providing a holistic tool set to design, build, and evolve um, adaptive socio-technical systems that are optimized for fast flow of change uh, that enables us to, be, to adapt, uh, evolve, and thrive in the face of constant change. And with that, there are some resources. I'm sharing my slides, by the way. And uh, yeah, its book is coming out next year. So. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, not sh I'm not sure if you have qu time for questions, or I'm sorry, I was running Well, we have low. about two minutes left. That was okay. a lot of stuff in uh, 40 minutes. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll just dive right into it. So the, the most wanted answers are to the question, what is your typical approach to bring this combination of methods and the overarching goal, architectural flow, into an organization? Uh, as I said, it depends on your context. So for example, you can start, um, usually I start with gaining a common understanding of the landscape, creating a water map. So first of all, uh, because the users and the user needs, they sh they're supposed to be our anchor. And uh, so we have to, to, uh, to know what, for which users and what the user needs that we, are, that we are creating a product for. So you typically start with a Wartle map and identify the value chain um, that are then the components that fulfill these users directly or indirectly. And then uh, so typically I go also, you don't necessarily have to map the evolution stages from the very beginning that can start later and it's an iterative approach. And then you can dive into like, okay, what uh, to, to go into the user needs and try to derive what are potential boundaries to split your system apart into modular, modular parts like the bounded context from domain driven design. And then also try to, to identify like what could be potential um, responsibility boundaries for streamlined teams and going through the value chain, what could be potential platforms uh, that platform teams can provide. And uh, so, but it depends, you can also start, what, what are our pain points in our organization and start there. So where are the bottlenecks, where we have to, to, do, to um, elevate constraints, like from the theory of constraints, for example. So it depends on your own context. Okay, thank you very much for that one. 
Oh, I hope it fits a little bit with the question and answers some of the, the points. Please come to me if you have, uh, definitely. I'm, I'm <laughs> here today and tomorrow a little bit as well. Exactly. Let's go for the next one. Uh, with the most, what's by far so far. Has this approach been implemented successfully in practice? Yeah, so currently that the, the online schools example that you see is just a compilation of different projects brought together because everyone, uh, is, I would say it's, it's just, um, I started with it, um, uh, yeah, I guess when 2020, 2021, and I started at different areas, a different organization with different clients, and they are on the way, but it has not been like, for example, the evolution of team topologies interaction modes that I was highlighting at the end, that was more kind of like um, um, yeah, theory a concept that I introduced, but they are still trying to evolve, uh, to implement it. So it's not, has been not been uh, fully transitioned yet, uh, because I would say that's a multi-year project to, to establish this. Okay, cool. So we're on the, on the bleeding edge of, uh, of, of research here, so to speak. Hope, yeah, you, um, case studies, uh, client work, uh, research, all uh, so combined together. Th yeah. There's a lot, lot there already. Cool. Thank you so much. One last one. We're a little bit over, but the next thing is the lunch break. So I think. We oh can no! I, a, am I the one that helps you back from lunch? Uh, so. <laughs> 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 so what, one more is about optimization and the trade-offs, and um, usually whenever you optimize for something, you have to make some kind of trade-off, and. So what are the trade-offs when you optimize for you know, fast flow of change? That's a great question. Um, yeah, usually um, there is no, no best solution. So everything is a kind of collection of the worst trade-off when you look into architecture, of course. Um, I guess the, the trade-off is that um, one thing is it's kind of like overwhelming to learn all these concepts in the very first beginning. I guess it could be a high learning, uh, a steep learning curve at the beginning, that uh, so at least you have to understand the little uh, concepts, but there are also other approaches, like from team topologies, for example, they introduce like independent service heuristic that you can apply, or um, user need mappings also from team topology uh, team members as well introduced. So I guess um, it takes a while to, to grab the concept, but the good thing is you can start small and start with that that you have already learned. But I guess it's, it's at the beginning it could be quite overwhelming, so that I try to smooth or to, to um, a, a, yeah, a shallow uh, entry into architecture for flow. Okay. So we have lots of more questions, but as Susanne said, she's here till tomorrow evening, so you can easily approach her over there, over here, wherever you like. And so thank you once again, Susanne. Thank you.